From or I can I can talk for most of it too. I won't know how to answer that. I'll be like, oh. Good morning, everybody. May I call this meeting and this room to order? Um, I am Mavis Bates, and I am the chairman of the Energy and Environmental oh, Committee. Yeah, yeah. And I can't believe people aren't sitting down even now that I've started the meeting. Um, so it is nine o'clock, and thank you, everybody. Uh, for attending this meeting of the King County Energy and Environmental Committee. Clerk, please call the roll. Allen? Tyus? Tyus present. Roth? Roth here. Strathman? Strathman here. Young? Young here. Tarver? Tarver here. Bates? Bates here. Of course. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, everybody, for being here in person and virtually. Um, may I have a motion uh, and uh, or a consensus to approve the minutes from February 17th and March 17th? Madam Chair, I would, this is Caius, I would ask for a consensus for the uh, approving the consensus from the committee to approve the minutes from both February 17th and March 17th, 2023. Do we have a consensus? Yes. Yes, good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe there is some, a, a public um, commenter. Uh, we have one person signed up for public comment. Are they Where online? Are you, or? Mr. Polito? Is they're there online? There's no one out there in the audience. I don't. Oh, Mr. Polito, is this you? 630 ending in 372? That's Shepro. Oh, hi, Shep. I, th I think Claire actually spoke with the gentleman um, earlier last month. Okay. Um, well, I don't see him here. I guess the uh, the issue was about prescribed burns. Is there any? We sent him some resources. Okay. Thank you very much. So seeing no other public comments, we will move on to uh, the environmental report from Ms. Wolnick. I'm going to send my time to Claire today. <laughs> She's ceding her time to you, Claire. Can I make a comment? Yes, Ms. Lewis, please. Thank you. Um, this is just about Ms. Wolnick. Um, I'm just very thankful for her community involvement. And whenever there's a problem, like I was at a meeting in Aurora a couple weeks ago, um, 
with the development that's going in and the fact that she came and, you know, listened to their concerns and made sure that the county is doing everything they can on, you know, with the water and everything. Um, she's really a good asset in our community. So thank you for that. She's here. She's there. She's everywhere. <laughs> that's very true. Do, do, you watch, do you watch Ted Lasso? Yeah. <laughs> she's here. She's there. She's every blinking where. <laughs> She doesn't have time to. <laughs> she has no time to watch that last <laughs> Miss Ryan. Great. Um, am I all set to advance my slides? Thumb up. Wonderful. Okay. So um, as folks who've been on the committee for a while uh, probably remember, April uh, being Earth Month um, is also kind of the big recycling report for the previous year. <clears throat> And uh, you'll remember also, I, I gave you our household hazardous waste segment last time, so we don't have to talk about that. Today, it'll be primarily looking at what um, has been going on with curbside recycling and waste. Um, so, you know, what, what gets picked up in your wheelie bins and um, what the county has brought in through its recycling centers and events. Could I get it in slide view where it's like one slide at a time? There we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's start with our residential discards. Um, I got data for 181, 80, uh, 887 households that have curbside hauling service. Uh, 96 of those are served through a negotiated franchise agreement with their township or municipality. The other four would be unincorporated residents that contract directly with a waste hauler. You might be thinking, isn't that slightly more than the number of households in Kane County? It might be. Uh, the reason being for towns like Algonquin, and the city of Algin, city of Aurora, where they cross the county borders, the haulers give me the report for the entire municipality. They can't break it out by county. So you know, we, we do get some out of, out of county information, but at least it's consistently that way um, so that you know, we can compare still across years. So our total household discards in 2022 was 262,000 495 tons. And that number, I mean, that's a huge number. It doesn't mean that much. So I found different ways to break it out. Um, if you wanted to look at it on a per household basis, it would be 1.44 tons per household. Um, and if you wanted to look at it as, as a rate over time, it's 7.9, so almost eight pounds per household um, per day, or 2.8 pounds or almost three pounds per person in the county per day. Uh, Madam, <laughs> Madam yeah. Ryan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Is this garbage or recycling or both? It's everything combined. Okay. Hopefully, um, total discards. These numbers get yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. Total discards includes trash, recycling, yard waste, and organics. Um, and that's that's when we get into our diversion rate. So when a, a diversion rate includes anything that is set out curbside that does not go to a landfill. So it's primarily your recycling. And then also your uh, organic materials, your yard waste, and if you can put fruit scraps in there too. <clears throat> so our diversion rate in 2022 was 31.7% by rate. Um, and then the range for each for looking at each municipality was between 21% and I guess 54, but I think there was a, a data error. Um, yeah, they... Um, that municipality, the hauler reported an enormous amount of yard waste that was not like, did not make sense. So <laughs> I tried to get them to correct it and no luck yet. Hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of a caveat with this whole presentation, you know, with the residential stuff. My information is only as good as what the haulers give me and I can't honestly ground truth it. So I just got to go with what I get. Um, so when we're talking about trash from the coming from the county last year, 
it was 179,324 tons. Um, and I think it is sometimes easier to wrap your head around those these numbers if you convert them to volume. So you got about one and a half uh, million cubic yards or uh, 36,691 TEUs. Now, what the heck is a TEU? Um, it's a 20 foot equivalent unit, which is essentially what'll fit in a 20 foot shipping container. Um, my predecessor used to talk uh, when she gave these presentations, she'd talk about a trash train. So it's like if, if you loaded these shipping containers on a train, it would be like 170 miles long. And uh, that you can kind of conceptualize 170 miles, but no one's ever seen 170 mile long train. So I decided to do it uh, in terms of a container ship. Um, the container ship in this picture is called the Ever Ace. Um, if you guys remember in the spring of 2021, when we all needed maybe a little bit of a laugh, that um, that container ship, the Ever Given, got stuck horizontally in the Suez Canal um, and created a kind of global sort of meme. I bet it wasn't funny if you had stuff on that boat. But um, anyway. <clears throat> This this pictured ship is 15% larger than the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal. It's currently the largest container ship in the world, and it has a capacity of about 24,000 TEUs. So our trash would fit would fill that boat up one and a half times. Um, that is uncompacted because um, um, you got to be thinking like if that's just from King County, how would we ever come up with enough land to fill space? Well. The answer is that we use a great machine power to compress it as much as humanly possible before it goes in the landfill. So uncompacted, it would fill that boat one and a half times. Recycling, uh, we have about 64,000 tons, um, which translates to close to a million cubic yards. The, the conversion is different there because recycling is a lot lighter than trash. Um, so. Uh, the the volume calculation is different and you find um for the TEUs you have almost 23,000 so you're almost filling that boat up again and then with the organics there were close to 19,000 tons about 75,000 cubic yards or 1,742 TEUs so all told if you've put everything together you're going to fill the boat up approximately twice it's enormous enormous amount of material uh, what do you mean by firm? organics? Organics um, is, well, before we would have just called it yard waste. I, I call it organics now because I, we have at least a half a dozen municipalities where you can throw vegetable food scraps in, in with your yard waste. Um, the little pie chart there um, kind of shows the proportions of each thing, of each item. So your trash is... 68.3% uh, recycling was 24.5% and, and then the organics 7.2. So when we talk about our, our data for this year, it's just one point in time. Uh, and I thought because we have this wealth of hauler data going back at least 10 years, um, we, have, we have one more year of recycling and yard waste data than we do for garbage. Um, I thought it would be interesting to actually do it as a time series. Uh, and that's what you see here. Um, on the x-axis is, is time, the year. And then on the y-axis is material <laughs> discarded per household in pounds, not in tons. Um, so what we see with the trash, um, unfortunately, is a fairly steady increase over um, these years. Um, and then with the recycling, sadly, um, somewhat of a decrease, not as steep as the increase in trash, um, but it is there. Um, and what was interesting to me, so the R squared, um, which if you um, know statistics, you'll know what that is, but uh, it is essentially the strength of the linear relationship um, or the predictive power of the linear relationship. Um, if you're dealing with a life or death issue, you would want to see something in the 90 percents. 
Um, but for anything involving human behavior, which trash and recycling certainly is, um, really anything above 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is going to indicate a fairly strong relationship. So <clears throat> with our trash and recycling regression there, we see 0 0.85. That's, that's pretty strong. We can honestly say there is a strong I mean, there, there's a predictable increase in the amount of garbage over time and a predictable decrease in recycling. Um, again, not what we want to see, but this is what the data is showing. Um, we do not have a strong relationship for organics. So that seems to kind of bounce around between about 200 pounds per household per year and, um, and 400 with no linear relationship. It almost looks cyclical, but I, I don't know why. Um, and that, that, that's honestly the next step, I guess, for solving some of these problems is trying to figure out why this is happening with the trash and recycling. So I, I can hypothesize a few things in the recycling world. We talk a lot about light weighting. Um, that's where the same product loses weight over time. So for example, a 20 ounce Coke bottle in uh, to say the year 2000, possibly weighs weighed twice as much as one you would buy today empty, same same the, product the empty bottle yeah empty. just the empty bottle weighs twice as much and it's because they figured out how to make a product like a bottle that serves the same purpose that weighs uses half the amount of material which from an environmental standpoint i mean that's good but um it does decrease the weight of recycling coming in unless people are buying double the amount of product that they used to um I'm not sure that tells the entire story because um, I think you'd see light weighting happening with trash too. So people that just don't recycle or throwing those same bottles in the trash, um, but also other other products like your flexible packaging, kind of becoming more predominant way to store food, um, and that's very lightweight um, compared to some of the older packaging. So I I don't think that fully explains everything. Um, the other thing to think about is that, you know, garbage, uh, especially, so recycling is really just non-durable items, right? They're things that go in recycling and that we're told to put in recycling are for the most part things that are, were built to be used once and then thrown away. Uh, with garbage, it includes both that kind of thing, but also durable goods uh, that have reached the end of their life. Um, there is recycling for some durable goods, obviously I'll be talking about electronics and textiles later, um, but for a lot of stuff there's, you know, it just gets, it gets thrown away. So I would be interested to just see trends about, um, you know, what is being, what is being bought and what, what's being thrown away um, to see if we can untangle why this is happening. Um, the other thing I, w w would really help would be, a, um, a new version of the statewide uh, waste characterization study. Um, the last one I believe was published in 2015, but used data from early in the 2010s. So, you know, we can maybe explain the very, we have information about the very early part of that graph, but not subsequent. Ms. Ryan, can I ask a question, please? Um, in Aurora, I was part of the SWAC committee, SWAC team, Solid Waste Advisory Committee, that started our recycling program, and it was sticker-based. And so anything that was recycled went into the recycling bin and was free. Anything that went into the garbage, you had to put your sticker on your garbage can. And I think people recycled more back then because it was all this volume-based, and I'd like to know if there's any data on, because now we've gone to these enormous bins um, and it's sort of a flat, flat rate and you can just throw a lot into that garbage can and no sticker. In the garbage or recycling? Well, we have two. We have a recycling bin and a garbage bin, but the garbage bin is so enormous. You don't need a sticker anymore? No, we don't need a sticker. Uh, hey, Charles, they still have a sticker. Yeah. And, and I'm just, I just think people are throwing crap into those enormous garbage, you know, hand trucks. 
I, um, you don't have to answer it now. <laughs> if yeah, it's too hard, that's okay. I am, I am starting to do a, a better job of, of tracking that, like how the different municipal um, waste contracts are organized um, around payment. Like um, was mentioned, there are some that are still volume based if you choose to go that way. Um, I like I where I live, I could choose to sticker each of my garbage bags. I don't because it's a real pain. It is a pain. Um, yes, so it always I was a pain. Use the, I use the big tote, even though I don't fill it up every week. You know, it's fine. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Um, Claire, could we break out? Is it possible to break out the, once you determine what cities still have the stickers? Because I agree with Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I, I'm in St. Charles. You tend to recycle more, you know, to save yeah. money. It's a game. Well, but then see if the, the chart changes, if we could break that out, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because I would think like St. Charles would be higher on recycle, but the facts are in the facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, my next slide got said that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. We go back. You Thank had you. said there was a, Mr. Caius. Yes, Mr. Caius, please. Uh, back to, you had said that there was a state report. Could you explain that a little bit more? With the um, there, there was a state waste characterization report. So it, that is basically looking at what goes into the landfill and what is recycled and what is composted and, and then breaks it down into what actually that material is. Is it like mattresses? Is it paint? You know, is it household hazardous waste? What is going into no, these waste sponsored. streams? Um, I, I believe so. I, I don't remember who paid for it. Um, Something the legislative committee would be interested in. And we have this because you'd say that would be valuable to re. It sounds to me that more data like that would be very valuable for us to analyze. It, it so, would. I mean, it would be even better if we could do one for the county. But <laughs> yeah. Do we need one for the county? Um, that would that be something that this committee should uh, try to do? It would it would help me got on the right track to figure out why well i why think that i happening. think we all yeah. need to help you yeah. help us get on the right track i Let's, don't know what the first steps would be but i would be in favor of uh or consent to to yeah. at least look in and examine that and either state or local if local if we could be great great miss okay. walnut can you advise us on how to get that study or should we just discuss this offline okay Good. Well, I think this is a, I, I feel <laughs> energy, the, the committee getting energized to try and help us do that. Cool. Yeah. Well, if it fit in your schedule, I apologize for that. <laughs> oh, no, I'll figure it well, out. Somebody else to do it for us. Yeah. I don't know if she can do it or not. Love okay. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, so after that bad news, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, lighten it up a little uh, and point out which municipalities were um, at the top of our recycling list um, this year. Uh, so East Dundee way out ahead with 40% by weight of the material um, that they put out was diverted from landfill. Interestingly enough, you, East, Dundee, East Dundee and Pingree Grove, number two, they're served by the same hauler. Um, and I, so I don't know if that means anything. Uh, they, I don't believe either one of those is a volume-based contract. I could be wrong about Pingree Grove. I know East Dundee is is not fully volume-based. So, yes. yeah. Madam Chair, I would think that sampling would be really important, which essentially you're taking a sample that they're taking. So if it's examining the sampling, would it indicate whether it was a, a carrier error or a sampling error or if it, they're actually – because that's great that East Dundee, I mean, that's my neighbor, so. Yeah. But still, makes you wonder. Uh, Roth here, I, Claire, I just have a, a question. Can you define again volume base? Is that similar what Aurora is versus sticker base? I mean, is that? No, volume base. Oh. Oh, um, yeah. So, so volume base means you, you, the amount you pay for your trash is based on the amount of volume of trash you put out. Um, a sticker base. Okay. Often. So volume base means sticker. Um, okay. yeah, you got you got ones where I do think they do this in East Dundee, where you can opt into a smaller trash tote, like a thirty-five gallon, and pay less. Um, and St. Charles used to have that. I yeah. I do my 
my own can because you know it's, it's sticker are a lot cheaper than the monthly rental on the cans right yeah um yeah mr shepherd please mute yourself so the, we see we see our our third place finisher and our two runners up uh, being very very close together um around just over 30 percent um gd men st charles are two of those um volume based or sticker based programs so that might be helping them yeah madam chair another question for claire sorry um i think st charles does not have um recycling for apartments though is that correct is it um, true of most towns <laughs> Technically, all um, all of Caton County apartments should be recycling by county ordinance. It's not up to the city. Okay. It's up to the um, manager, apartment manager, apartment owners to um, know what the law is and to uh, follow it by offering recycling. Um, okay. But it's I'll uh, have to follow up. I, I yeah. thought I remember reading and that might have been years ago. Um, yeah, but since they don't pay at an apartment, you know, they have no incentive to recycle necessary compared to a home. Yeah, home. other than, other than Plus their the residence. the trash bin is full, then they throw everything in the recycle, which is. Right. Yeah, they're, they're, it can be hard to uh, get an uncontaminated stream from multifamily. It's, it's a challenge, but it's, you know, something apartment managers need to be doing. Okay, thank you. Um, I did want to show you my thingy isn't working. There we go. I did want to show you these as well. Um, this is going to be hard to read, um, just like from a physical perspective, not, uh, but I, I made these charts by region of the county. Um, and they're, they're on our website, um, on the URL at the bottom there. Um, and for each one, I, I put a couple of lines in to give context. The, the bottom flat line is the 2018 national average diversion, which oh, was- So up is good, right? An down upward is slope is good, down, down is bad, but um, to some extent, these relationships are not, I, I ran the linear relationship again, like just, explaining how much of you know the variation and where these points are can be explained by change in time and, and you see the for each municipality the the r squared value so the strength of that relationship tends to be a lot lower than when you put it all together and do it for the county um so yeah i i wouldn't put too much attention i guess on some of those lines but more more the points so like especially like east dundee is on that is on that um graph they're the yellow triangle and the yellow line uh, i mean from the yellow line it looks like you know there's been no change over time but that is an incredibly small r value so so really there's just been a ton of variation in East Dundee. They had serious problems in 2020, which I suspect has something to do with COVID and, and them using a, a much smaller hauler uh, than, than many other communities uh, that they just struggled to, to find a place to put their recycling during COVID um, is my theory. Uh, but then you look at the last two years, they've done a lot better. So, you know, I, I, and I wrote this in kind of the interpretation on the website, uh, you know, the, the weaker relationships me, mean, if you're looking at this and you're a resident, if your town did a bad job of a bad job or just, you know, was low on the recycling scale or diversion scale last year, it doesn't mean that is your fate going forward. You know, people do have the, the power to change their behavior and talk to their neighbors and um, reverse some of these weak trends. Um, right, so we have the, the national average um, at 32% and then at the top, that's our diversion goal from our last solid waste management plan is to get 52% by weight of our material diverted. 
Uh, and you can see we've, we've got a big challenge ahead of ourselves to uh, to reach that goal with any of the towns on, on both on this chart. But I did this for all the municipalities. I just grouped them at the moment by um, by location. Uh, but I'll tell you, none of them are are you know at that fifty two percent. Madam Chair, or Claire. Yeah. Um, you're not showing a county number though on this, right? You're saying our goal is fifty two, but you're not showing. You're just showing a couple of the cities, right? Right. This this show this shows just municipalities together. Right, right, I didn't right. put the county average on here. Um, I'd be curious because if our goal is fifty two, what are we at right now with the county? Well, for twenty twenty two, we were at thirty one point seven. Okay. Yeah. At the bottom. Thank you. Line is that? That's not. not oh, there is not. Line. It's that, not. That is my question. On here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's just northeastern came. Right. So if you wanted to look at the others, they're on online today um, at that URL um, recycling or county of cane forward slash recycling forward slash pages forward slash cane waste trends. Oh, that's easy. A yeah. A nice short one. Um, so one thing I, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit, I don't really think it's reflected in our data, but a lot of people point to 2018, 2017, 2018 as a big turning point in recycling. I just want to go back real quick to this one. Um, <laughs> and when I say it's not reflected in our data, we don't see a big crash in recycling countywide between 2017 and 2018. We don't really see much variation at all, hence the strong value. So I'm not super sure um, how much of a role is playing, but I did want to address it because it's a question I get asked semi-frequently. So th there has been quite a lot of cynicism about recycling when it kind of came to public attention around 2017 that we were sending quite a lot of our recycling material to China. Uh, because what happened in 2017 is China said, yeah, we're not taking it anymore. Just period, you're cut off. Um, and the, the, so the orange on this bar graph represents over the years, the volume of recycling that was being sent to China and Hong Kong from the U S. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. What was the, I, the question? OECD, the acronym? Yes. OECD is the organization for economic cooperation and development. Um, it, Basically, OECD countries are generally considered developed nations um, or sometimes close trading partners to developed nations. So Mexico, for example, is in the OECD, um, whereas non-OECD countries are typically your developing countries. Um, India, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, those would all be non-OECD countries. Um, so, you know, and again, following this kind of cynicism, a lot of people assumed that when China stopped taking imports of U.S. recycling, that we just simply shipped it to other countries, um, such as Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, et cetera. And you did see that happen a little bit in 2018. That's the black bar on the graph is the amount going to other developing nations. We didn't increase the size of the black bar. But what's also very noticeable is we were simply exporting a much lower amount of recyclables. And that trend has continued to 2022. Um, you also start to see <clears throat> a growth in the amount being exported to other developed nations. Today, or 2022, the biggest importer of US recyclables was Canada. Uh, and then the second largest was Mexico. Um, so, you know, I, to, to the cynic, I would say we're actually finding ways to process our recycling in, in, in the nation domestically um, and therefore fueling, you know, American jobs and remanufacturing jobs to actually take the recycled material and make new things from it. Um, and we're also, I mean, any any recycling coming from the U.S. that's going to a developing nation and being dumped, like any amount of that to me is unacceptable. Um, however, 
you know, you can't assume that because something is being sent to Indonesia or India, it's being dumped or burned inappropriately. There are legitimate recycling facilities in those countries. I do think it's very important, though, for exporters to be transparent and, and to that who they're working with overseas. So, you know, I just wanted to address that because I, even in this committee, I've had questions about, well, you know, is everything just being sent overseas to be burned and, and dumped in the ocean or in, on the land? Um, and really it's not, we're, we're just not exporting nearly as much as we used to. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. is a good thing. Um, and a big part of that too in the recycling industry has been fixing the bail. So the picture on the left uh, was from an NPR article that came out around the time of National Sword that shows bales, I believe it was in Oregon, it was definitely not in Illinois, that a recycler couldn't get rid of. Well, you know, I uh, don't really wonder why they couldn't get rid of that because it really does look like bales of trash. It's, you know, that's it mixed plastic, but it's got things that can't be recycled anywhere. It looks like there's some fencing in there. It's a mix of film plastic and hard plastic. It's just, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't blame any country for not wanting to import those left-hand bales. On the right-hand side, we have a picture uh, that I took on our tour of the uh, Heartland Recycling Facility last year, um, where those are, you know, those are uh, their HDP um, plastic number two bales. Um, you see a lot of different colors in there because the products are made in different colors, but you know, at least from a visual examination of the outside of those bales, they were at least 90% what they were supposed to be. Um, and that's, you know, that if, if any of that is getting exported, that certainly helps, uh, you know, make sure when, those bales reach their destination, that they're being processed appropriately. But it also helps, you know, in uh, domestic recycling, you can do something with that bale on the right. You really can't do very much with the one on the left. And, uh, you know, it's been um, adoption of better technology um, at the MRFs. I, I just saw another presentation um, yesterday about the role of artificial intelligence and in, in being able to sort these materials. It's you know, there's really some advanced technology at play. Um, and of course, the human element to a lot of the quality control work is still done by human beings um, that care about their jobs. So um, good stuff. All right. So now let's talk a little bit. My boat is back. Um, That's gonna, right. Yeah. Yeah, I ask you a question. Um, maybe this is coming, but um, I think that the questions I get about recycling are not where it's going in, you know, to other countries, but is it truly being recycled or is it just going into the landfill? So um, if it goes into a recycling bin and it goes to the MRF, then unless if it's contaminated or junk, it will go into, uh, I mean, I show people my pictures all the time. I say, I've been yeah. there, I've seen the bales, I've seen that this is being bought on the market for re for reuse. Yeah. So this process is incredibly expensive. You know, the amount of energy and, and just money it takes to run these facilities is immense. So it makes absolutely zero sense from a, like a, just a business perspective for them to actually make those bales and then send them to the landfill. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. it, it just, Good answer. It, it, it doesn't make any financial sense. And legally, and this is state law, they're required to, if they can find a buyer for the material, they are required to sell it, even if it's at a loss. They are not allowed to landfill it unless there's literally no buyer. Um, and I mean, again, what you see on the left, there is literally no buyer for that. Because it's um, junk. It's junk. What you see on the right, if they can't find a buyer, then there's a, a very broken system. <laughs> we need to. Madam, yeah. Madam Chair, I have a. a def, I heard the term you said MRF or something like that. Oh what yeah, is that? I said that. Yeah. Yeah, a MRF is a material recovery facility. Um, it's essentially a, a sorting plant where they take. And those are usually owned by the disposal company. They are, yeah, they're often owned by the haulers. Um, LRS, Groot, and Waste Management are big haulers, all 
own a MRF. Um, there are MRFs that are operated by companies other than those. Okay. But majority um, are haulers. I would say so, yeah. And then the companies what that they sell to are the what the core recyclers and what would what's the term you would use for them? I, I guess I would maybe call the buyers remanufacturers. Okay. Um where where they're going to take the material and um make it into new things. I mean Jody and Ivy and I met with a gentleman from uh Rea's Coca-Cola bottling. And they they're just hungry for their own bottles back um, to remanufacture into new bottles because that's what's been sold to the public is bottle to bottle recycling. And is it's, that cheaper than using new plastic too? I no, I had heard that it's more expensive. It, it is. It, it's yeah. At the moment, it is more expensive, but they've made commitments to the public to do the it. Bottle <laughs> Pepsi to Pepsi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't, the they wouldn't buy these bales. Well, that, that's HDP. So no, they they don't want. Yeah. The, so, they, yeah. So say the term again of the people that would be buying it. What what would be the term you'd want to use? I guess remanufacturers. Okay. Um, you could call them recyclers too. It's just a different stage. Okay. In the recycling process. So, and the reason I ask, then the next question: How many of those do we have in Kane County? Uh, I actually don't know. I don't know. Because I'm aware of a, a large one. I was in the fencing business for two years, and I forget the company's name, but they they're setting up shop in the old caterpillar plant in Montgomery, and they're making wood fence. And I think they're only using milk jugs. And they're making and they're fences. The fence parts, yes. That's exciting because I drove past Caterpillar yesterday, and the parking lot was full. So and it's not in the past, it's been full of weeds. Right, right. And now it's full of cars. Right. So. And they were concerned. They had like three or four buildings, and they were. And this is like two years ago. We talked to them. Um, we were trying to get them to be a supplier for. I was working for Peerless Fence, and they were so busy. They said no. But yeah, know, that that is. If we if we started identifying those, that could maybe be an incentive to not have to, you know more efficient use yeah that would, that would definitely so, they're, they're part of the circular economy right the, the cradle the cradle users right. are really so instead of shipping it overseas you know ship it down the road yeah. and, and so i just thought i'd throw that out yeah yeah definitely one more question yeah <laughs> what well, once it's gone from milk bottles to um fence posts when those fence posts were out can they be recycled this is a dead end that's why it's not this yeah. is down cycling, not quite recycling. My understanding of those materials is that they are composites. It's composite um, high density polyethylene or low density HDPE and um, and wood pulp, uh, wood pulp. Unusually wood pulp. So you can't reseparate those. That's the case definitely for like track stacking. I, I don't know exactly what they're making in Montgomery, but it probably is a composite because not many people are super excited about 100% plastic fencing. But um, because uh, and the reason is because of expansion is yeah. you can't control it. But they, they have a uh, specialized process and they're going to it was two years ago I had the presentation, but they were pretty um, long warranty they were offering. Yeah. It, is it's turning i mean it's turning a non-durable good your hdp container into right. a durable good at least right. so like it should last at least 20 years and, it, and i think they were offering yeah. that okay thank you oh wrong button <laughs> we better keep moving <laughs> yeah I, my my presentation isn't super super long but i do want to get to the end of it uh, i do want to talk a little bit about commercial discards uh this is non-construction demolition debris so there were eleven thousand six hundred eighty three commercial accounts reported um for the county only half of them have recycling service i, I do want to make a distinction that it doesn't necessarily mean that only half of businesses recycle we are not able to capture backhauling where the companies fill the trucks that come in with products where and send them away carrying recycling um i would be very surprised if that's not what big box stores and grocery stores are doing um they they all have balers in their distribution centers so why wouldn't they 
haul back haul their material bail it and sell it themselves and make the money instead of passing that money on and actually paying a waste management facility to do it so you know there are a lot of businesses in king county that should be recycling that aren't i i don't believe it's a full half but um no i digress <laughs> so our total commercial discards were 206 uh you can read the number but over 200,000 tons or 17.7 uh, .7 tons per account. Um, if you wanted to look at that as a rate, um, it would be 2.2 pounds per King County resident. If if you think the companies are kind of, they're operating on our behalf, I don't know. So you would add that to your 3.2 coming from residential um, to get an idea of how much waste is coming out of King County per resident. Um, the county diversion rate uh, for your commercial discards is pretty low. It's only 16 and a half percent. And if you put everything together, all that material together, you're going to fill um, your ever ace that enormous container ship up once uh, with material coming from your commercial sector. Uh, so the residential is bigger than commercial. The residential yes. is two, two, two ships and this two, is one yes. ship. Yes, yes. Um, we don't have quite as strong a relationship, uh, especially with the trash and commercial. I think there's probably, you know, business things impacting that more. I mean, with things like COVID openings and closings and reopenings and all that, it's pretty variable. Um, the recycling is a, is a fairly strong relationship. And again, it's negative. So uh, it's a bummer. <laughs> Um, talk just very briefly about construction and demolition debris. Um, the total amount that was reported to me was uh, 56,000 tons. Um, however, I think we capture a very small amount of total construction and demolition debris because we only get the amount that's put in roll off containers and sent to haulers. We don't get material that's back hauled again, uh, like that picture on the right where they loaded it straight into a truck and then that truck goes to a fill facility and drops off we just don't get that information <clears throat> um the the diversion rate so what was not landfilled was about 27 percent um and i didn't use the container ship here because it's a much smaller numbers <laughs> was that demolition or construction it is it's lumped in together uh construction or demolition debris so it could be from one or the other okay. um do you want to talk about our recycling centers um we had a total haul of 598.7 tons of material from our recycling center uh, and it was up 40 percent over last year and i'll talk a little bit about why in a second um, just keeping on my transport theme, it's the equivalent weight of 40 school buses. So it's a lot of stuff. Um, 11,000 residents served at our sites are in air quotes. Uh, I'll explain that in a second too. Um, so it looks like the number of people served went down 10%, but somehow the amount of material went up 40%. Well, what's going on there? The, uh, kind of the, secret here the the big change is the lrs site that we're now counting in our numbers so lrs has a transfer station in alburn they also use it as an e-waste recovery site it is open to the public you don't have to be an lrs customer anyone can go and drop off the sarah the state regulated electronics at that site and they charge only for the tvs and monitors and they charge the same amount as eWorks does at our sites because all the material collected there is going to eWorks. Um, and but most of the electronic material coming from the LRS Alburn site is not actually dropped off by members of the public. It's picked up by LRS as part of their waste contracts. They are increasingly putting e-waste service in their waste contracts um, included in the base fee um sugar grove has it monthly that's the most frequent i've seen our contract with lrs from mill creek has it twice annually um i think that's more common it's usually maybe quarterly or twice annually 
they you sign up you're able to put um up to i think it's like 10 items out they'll come collect it um one thing i was trying to untangle before today um uh, in my presentation was if any of that material is coming from out of the county uh because lrs does you know trash routes in dupage they do them in uh, probably to um McHenry, they're all over the place. Cook, um, and if they're bringing any of that to Alburn before trucking it to Elk Grove and uh, E Works in Elk Grove, and I was not able to get an answer to that. So it's possible some of the electronics we're counting are coming from outside of the county. Um, we saw a pretty big increase in the textiles being dropped off at our centers. That has nothing to do with LRS. They only take electronics. Um, a pretty big increase in the amount of books and paper and a massive increase in cardboard. Um, I did want to mention, you know, our recycling centers too, we're talking about commercial businesses recycling. I know a lot of small businesses bring their cardboard to us. Uh, just at Batavia or when we were in Aurora, they were doing it. They save it up and drop it off because that's the only, for like a small florist, that might be the only recyclable they generate is cardboard and it's a lot cheaper for them to spend, drive those miles and drop it off with us than it is to get a dumpster for their cardboard so um our recycling events we shredded just over 30 tons of documents um that was down quite a lot over 2021 um we weren't able to shred in 2020 due to COVID. Um, and I think that created a huge spike in 21. We've responded uh, by only having two shred events for this year um, and see how it goes. Hopefully they won't be absolutely crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we saw a similar decrease uh, with latex paint collected uh, 12 tons uh, last year. We did about the same on, with aerosols. Um, we did battery collection last year for, for the public for the first time uh, since 2019. It was a little less the amount last year than, than 2019, but it was plenty for me. If I ever see another battery again, I'm going to freak. <laughs> um, so you're saying don't drop them off at your desk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because I had to physically move them all due to my poor planning. So we won't be doing that again exactly the same way. <laughs> um, through the extravaganza, we collected 420 tons of, uh, of bulbs, um, which was um, close to 1,300 mercury-containing units, um, 300 pounds of styrofoam, and uh, 1,500. 100 pounds of bicycles sent for repair and reuse, uh, which was a lot more than the last time we did bicycles, but I, I think that was just an off year because Jennifer usually got quite a lot of bikes too. So our total impact, I am reaching the end, I promise, because I know we're running it against time. Um, our total impact in 2022, including the household hazardous waste, which I told you about last month, was 682 tons of material. You're looking at the weight, this is weight, not volume. I know I talked about volume before, but um, I couldn't math the math on that. Uh, the equivalent in weight to 91 fully loaded large school buses or 2.7787 at takeoff weight, fully fueled. That's a lot of material. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that the recycling program does is provide information services about recycling to our residents. Um, I personally answered thousands of public inquiries via phone and email. I'm not able to actually count the amount because it's too many, but I'm on the phone <laughs> a lot. And I, when I go downstairs, I will have five voicemails. Um, I gave nine presentations, um, eight on recycling, one on composting. I should say we gave nine presentations because it wasn't just me. I'm uh, lucky to have help from uh, Courtney Meyer, who is uh, working as uh, our kind of recycling education liaison, particularly for schools. Um, I tabled at five community events. I say yay there, because for the most part, these last year was the first time these were coming back after COVID. Uh, distributed close to 20,000 Green Guide copies. Um, the Recycling Center's webpage, so the part of my webpage that talks about our centers is the third most viewed page on the King County domain after the home page and the employment page. <laughs> um, it had at least 35,000 unique views by at least 
13,000 uh, and some odd individual users. Um, the recycling events page and the hard to recycle A to Z list are also in the top 10 most viewed pages on the domain. So that's really cool. You're very popular. I am. <laughs> and I've paid a lot of attention to those pages recently. So hopefully people are noting the increase in information. Um, so altogether on the top 10 recycling pages had almost 100,000 unique views. Um, I'd made three interactive maps, so I made those. So I know, you know, the, the numbers are right. Um, and it was only from last year. If you combine them all, they have close to 40,000 total views. Uh, and we um, have a new Facebook for King County government. Um, and they put at least 22 recycling related posts up there. King County Connects. Um, I wrote 28 articles for King County Connects, uh, including covering a lot of topics, um, and like a lot of perennial questions about batteries, light bulbs, latex paint. Um, I did do a big picture question about, you know, where does my waste go? Uh, what, how does single stream recycling work? Is it really all just going to the landfill? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, sustainability topics, uh, preventing food waste, compost at home, litter, et cetera. And uh, program announcements and highlights are our, our top ones tend to be the announcements. Uh, people are looking for King at uh, King County Connects for their news. Um, so what's going on? Um, and yeah. Ms. Ryan. Yeah. Are these articles on our website too? Um, they're on the King County Connects archive. I don't, uh, uh, the archive um, of the King County recycling pages is a big work in progress because everything got wiped when King County Connects transitioned and I haven't oh. caught up yet. Um, I'd like to see those in your spare time <laughs> or in somebody's, maybe we could get an intern. Yeah. It would help you um, yeah. put those back up, up online. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't want to put archive the announcements because they're kind of like no, but, find no, them but get know, confused about <laughs> alkaline batteries, light bulbs, and yeah, you know, that's ongoing. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yep. Good job for an intern. And finally, my busy, busy Earth Month. Um, you guys uh, hopefully saw my email about the campaign sign recycling. That's all done and dusted. Um, I, I learned yesterday just a point of interest. Um, those signs go to the Murph we toured. They got put on the tipping floor and pushed straight into the baler because it's it's not single stream. It's just one material. So they don't need to be sorted. Um, I've got a partner hosted recycling event uh, tomorrow morning at Dundee Public Library. If anyone feels like dropping by with electronics, books and paper and clothing and textiles. And then on Earth Day, I'll be at Peck Farm Park as part of Geneva's uh, Earth Day celebration. <laughs> Uh, townships and municipalities only tire recycling event going on the week after. Um, this is for tires that have been dumped on uh, public rights away and the Department of Public Works have picked up. Uh, we'll be collecting them at the old judicial center um, during specified hours on those dates. And then the contractor will come and actually remove all the tires on the 27th, working a little bit with building management uh, just to manage traffic flow for that. Um, our first hosted event will be the Shred and More, the spring one on the 29th of April at the Circuit Clerks Building from 8 to noon. Uh, we'll have four shredder trucks um, shredding residents document to keep uh, shredded paper out of the single stream recycling. We'll be doing latex paint and aerosols, child car seat recycling. Um, none of the local targets uh, were participating in their corporate child seat take back the closest one is like in Chicago. So I, um, that might be popular too. Uh, we'll be doing clothing and textile and, and home good recycling. And it'll be our first time accepting a lot of these home goods. So pillows, toys and games, uh, small home decor items and picture frames, luggage. We've never done any of that before. So it'll be really interesting to see how that goes. Um, and it's an amazing <laughs> committee member uh, volunteer opportunity if you'd like to. Uh, just reach out to me by phone or email, and I'd be happy to have you. And I think I'm finally done. Okay, sorry, Ivy. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Ivy. You have three minutes. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, Miss Lewis. <laughs> She's chilled. She's I chilled have, today. I have a question, though. Oh, Miss Lewis. Oh boy. So, 
Certainly. player. It, it, it depends on <laughs> it depends on Claire's answer. I don't know. Yeah. I can ask a question in short time. So just I was on my drive driving up here and I was talking to one of my sisters, as I always do. And I I told her, yes, hands free, of course, absolutely. Um, and I was told I told her that, you know, what my meeting schedule was, and I was gonna stop by here for this one. And I said, and you know, and I said, man, after we had that hailstorm last week, I really believe in global warming. And she said, well, well, you know, just anecdotally. And she said, well, I do too. But she goes, what, what can we really do that makes a difference to this? And I think, and, and I was like, well, you can recycle. You can use your um, electric lawnmower instead of your gas. But, you know, and, and I think that's sometimes what people think is what does my little bit of stuff matter? And so I, it would be really cool if somehow, and I guess it's not really a question, but you know, like what do we tell people when they say, how do, what can I do personally that's gonna matter? Um, I, I think my biggest, if you have a if you have a home, I would encourage people, not a home, but a house, a single yeah. family house. I, I definitely encourage at home composting and or or use of the food scraps and or, organics, because like a lot of the from a global warming perspective, so much of the greenhouse gas associated with our waste is from food scraps. So, I mean, just be cognizant of your food buying. Don't overbuy stuff that's going to end up getting thrown out. And, and when you do have food waste, compost it as best you can, because that it does make a big difference on the methane emission part. Um, my other one would be reuse. I mean, it could, people always forget it. it comes before recycle. So does reduce. <laughs> like, think about what you're buying. Do you really need it? Are you buying landfill fodder? especially uh kills me for families around the holidays like just the little easter gadgets and junk and, and i i i don't buy it but my family does and i'm like oh god <laughs> but, every yeah. every bottle that you every tin can that you recycle it uses a lot less energy to recycle that tin can that steel can than it would to mine the mine the ore out of the ground Put the steel through a steel smelter plant. Roll out the roll out the dough. Roll out the tin yeah. sheet. Make it into a can. You're using so much less energy and creating yeah. less pollution when you recycle instead of mining stuff out of the ground and yeah. you know heating it up with many different processes. Uh, yeah, and for people that like are, are already like environmentally conscious, I try and just remind gently of the reduced part, like your reusable water bottles and such shouldn't be like a collector's item where you have like 500 of them or like the newest <laughs> brands or whatever, the like status symbol, um, you know, really reuse your reusable stuff until it can't be reused anymore. Like the reusable shopping bags uh -oh. are an environmental negative if you use it a couple of times and throw it in the garbage because it got a stain on it or whatever. You really have to reuse your reusable stuff to make it work. And and put in solar panels if yeah. you want to help unless stop you live, climate change. Unless you live in the historic district in Aurora, which you can't. Then get on a community community solar or do, in aggregation. I keep telling my available. sustainability people. Okay. But anyway, thank you for that. You're I welcome. just thought it was a great now, question to have discussed this, this morning. Please. <laughs> Quick. Minus oh. one minute. Oh, Miss Allen. Good morning, everyone. Um. First off, don't ever worry about the time of a meeting. Hey, 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 <laughs> you be quiet. You may have some people who think that an hour is magical, but the fact is the content is much more important than the time. And we don't get that much time with you, so we are always grateful for it. I have I have a couple of a couple of questions. One is the backhauling uh, technique that you talked about. Is there any way that those uh, truckers would recycle only because the stuff that they're carrying is stuff that, as you say, has value, the cardboard and stuff? Well, it's not it's not up to the, the driver. So what happens, like Jewel, I'm just using Jewel as an example because um, 
they, they were part of a recent webinar I watched about the plastic bag stuff. So what happens is that the truck comes from Jules Distribution Center, which is relatively local. It's somewhere in northern Illinois. And they go, the trucks go out to each store full of produce and food and everything that Jules sells. They, you know, unload their inventory and then they reload the same truck with all the plastic bags <laughs> that are collected at the grocery store. But I, I'm, I'm hypothesizing, I don't know, because I haven't talked one-on-one -on -one with a jewel manager, but I'm hypothesizing they also put all their car corrugated cardboard in there um, and possibly other recyclable materials. They then, that truck then goes back to the distribution center and it unloads the plastic bags and cardboard and possibly other materials. They have a baler at the distribution center um, I know that as a fact. Um, so they bail up all that plastic and Jewel sells it to Trex, who then uses the plastic, mixes it with wood pulp and makes deck. Um, and I think, you know, if, if I were Jewel and I'm thinking, you know, how to maximize my profits, I would also bail all that cardboard and sell it to West Rock or whoever else, um, you know, wants it for recycling. Um, so I, I'm just wondering how much more of that is happening among other companies that we don't even know about, because I only get information from licensed waste haulers and, you know, the trucking, commercial trucking companies that serve supermarkets are not commercial waste haulers. Yeah, so. Um, can I also follow up? I, I remember that the, the people who developers who were doing construction for a while seemed to be willing to take a lot of their unused stuff and like uh, get it over to the rehab stores. Recycle. Re restore, yeah. Restore. restore, yeah. And that they also put some effort into recycling lumbery stuff, the kind of stuff that, that uh, they used to just landfill. Are, are they... I know de development is different now, but is there any chance that they are still thinking along those lines of trying to be good citizens? Do you know? I, I'm not sure. Um, there are definitely contractors that specialize in deconstruction, which is is kind of a facet of demolition. Um, is is when you have to have obviously a structure torn down. They do it more thoughtfully, and they do put every effort into finding a reuse stream for the material coming from the disassembled building oh. um it's kind of a niche though and you you have to take the kind of interest in doing that for for just a kind of a, a normal run-of-the-mill construction or demolition company i am not honestly sure um i don't yeah. know yeah. yeah we do try and promote restore as much as possible I, on our hard to recycle A to Z list, they must have like 25 mentions because there's so much you can take there. Thanks. Thank you, Miss Allen. Great story. Oh. It's, it, it is fun. <laughs> Ms. Clee. <laughs> Thank you so much to Claire for that awesome presentation. Yes, that um, was really interesting. Yeah, I'm going to be giving a few quick updates on sustainability programming for this month and some things to look forward to. Um, the An update on the Climate Action Implementation Plan. Um, there were two community listening sessions uh, completed last month, one in Geneva in this room um, and one in Aurora, and we had um, over 70 attendees. We were really happy with the participation, um, and I included some photos from those events. It was a really great presentation by the consultant that we're working with, and we had a lot of participation and interest and a lot of great questions from the public. Um, so it was a good time. And um, I also did want to let you all know about an upcoming community listening session that we are hosting in partnership with Elgin. Um, they are having an Elgin Earth Summit um, on the same day as the Shred event, April 29th. That's a Saturday. Um, and Kane County will be giving a community listening session from 1145 a.m. to 1245 p.m. Um, and they're also going to be having a bunch of other programming and other speakers at that event um, for Earth Month. So we are looking forward to that and uh, participating in their event and hearing from that community. 
additionally, I just want to give uh, an update on uh, next steps. Once these community listening sessions are completed, we will be working on the climate action planning team finalization. So that will look like a group of around 50 to 60 participants. We will have uh, workshop meetings to kind of get into more of discussion um, surrounding different sectors and climate issues that those sectors are facing, as well as some of the discussing some of the strategies um, that we talked about in these community listening sessions and, and get feedback um, and discussion form from those participants. So, um, and, and we're in the process of figuring out who can participate in that. And um, there is the, the planning team is a little bit more of a time commitment. So if we have people who are interested in participating, we're also gonna offer another opportunity to participate in a focus group um, for those who you know can't commit to a, a couple month long um, meetings, they can just come to one or two events um, and participate with us. So we are looking forward to that. Uh, here's a flyer for the um, Earth Summit. And you're welcome to go if you if anyone has any questions feel free to reach out to me and I can send you the information. And we are also hosting the annual rain barrel and compost bin program with the conservation foundation. Um, so this year we will be working with them and Upcycle, who we uh, work with annually for this program, to provide rain barrels and compost bins to the public. The rain barrels will be $64.50, and the compost bins are going to be Upcycle. We are not using um, the earth machine composters again they're not available this year with a program so um, upcycle will be providing those for uh, 7550 um, and then there are additional accessories available as well so those are available for purchase on the website and the idea with this sale is that we host a pickup event um, so that members of the public don't have to pay um, for home delivery they can come to a local spot to pick up uh, the products that they ordered um, we have online ordering available now through May 10th, and the pickup event will be at um, Leroy Oaks Nature Preserve on Tuesday, May 16th in the afternoon through the evening. Um, and Claire and I will also be hosting a um, webinar with Jessica Mino from the Conservation Foundation to talk about their conservation at home program, as well as share a little bit about um, the county's programming as well. That will be Tuesday, April 25th in the evening, and I've included the link um, to RSVP for that. And there's the link at the bottom uh, if you want to check out what um, products are for sale. And I also just wanted to uh, provide an update about something that I heard about that was exciting. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. They are applying for an EPA climate pollution reduction um, grant. This program is um, funded by the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the idea is to provide grants to state, local government, tribes, and territories to develop and implement plans for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. It's a two-staged uh, grant program that is providing funding for planning grants and also um, for implementation grants. So the, um, the state of Illinois is going to receive funding, and then there's also a, uh, another um, funding opportunity for the Chicago metro region. So um, as a part of this plan, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus is going to apply to be the regional lead for the Chicago metro region to create a climate action plan. Um, and that will include King County within that jurisdiction, as well as um, a much larger um, the Chicago metro area. And then once, so they're applying for this planning grant to create, uh, they already have a climate action plan, which the county is implementing currently, um, but they're, they have to expand a little bit upon that to be included within the jurisdiction that the EPA is asking for with this grant. So they're planning to expand that a little bit. Um, and then once that planning grant is completed, I believe um, the timeline for that, they plan to complete that plan um, within one year and then following all the entities, um, so all the municipalities, counties that are incorporated within um, that climate plan, climate action plan region will be eligible for uh, climate um, action planning implementation grant funding. So grant funding is coming in a year or so. 
um, and Kane County will be eligible for that. So we are looking forward um, to support. So Kane County will be supporting the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus in their grant application. Um, and but either way, whoever wins the application, um, the county will be eligible for funding. So exciting opportunity that we are looking forward to in the next year. And I believe that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Klee. Any questions for Ms. Ivy Klee? Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any new business? Yes. Uh, Ms. Bates, Young. David Young. Young, please. Go ahead. Yes, I came across this uh, last week or earlier this week, and maybe uh, Ivy Klee knows about it, but there is a new a newer company on the west coast called New Scale, N U Scale, and their website is NewScalePower.com. They make a very small little nuclear reactor that's new technology, and you can power. It says on their website here, their Voyager plant can. Uh, just occupy 0 0.05 square miles and can generate the same amount of power as 94 square miles for wind and 17 square miles for solar. And we know that this is probably the um, lowest cost form of energy. So I just wanted to bring this up to see if anyone has ever heard of this before and has looked into new scale um, for, for power. This is Ivy. Um, no, I actually have not heard about um, that company or, or the products that they make. So I'd be interested in learning more. Okay. I'll send, I'll send you an email and then you can look into it, but this would be, it's very interesting. I just, I, it was, a, it was on like a popular mechanics website that I saw and then I looked into it and the, just just over literally over the last couple of days so this would, could be interesting for um you know people that are shutting down larger nuclear power plants as well as coal fired plants this this might be an option so I'll send it to you okay great thank you thanks this, this is an this is an issue that is in the Illinois state uh legislature right now uh, what, because we have a nuclear moratorium in Illinois, and uh, we have to wait and see if that nuclear moratorium is lifted, and then we have to decide if uh, these, um, they're very <coughs> experimental right now, very much under study, and um, quite, question, you know, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about their safety, so it's, it's a big question. Any other questions? Ms. Allen. Um, I know some people in this room who are a lot more enlightened than I am, and you've probably already been talking about this, but we had that presentation on the Geneva Creek. <laughs> yes. And I was just wondering, is, isn't that a perfect product project for our, our riverboat funds? If we were not always scrambling to spend riverboat money on county operations that that money should really not be spent on, then we could direct some of that money, maybe over a couple of years, with some of the money that Rob Linke said might be pulled out of a fund, and together put together a project that is, you know, wildly suitable to the three E's, which is why that money is given to us. And we could go forward with something that would really make a difference to the Fox River. Um, have you guys already started talking about that? That has been mostly in admin. We had a presentation by that. Uh, so if you check your uh, yesterday. YouTube, just yesterday, Wednesday. That's that's the Wednesday. one. That's the one I'm building off of. Yeah. And they're looking for about a million to do the project from 31 to River. I, I think is that. Mm -hmm. Okay. A, a full restoration would yeah. be one point something two. Well, um, could could that money be put to a better use? I can't think of any. But... <laughs> Thank you. That interesting idea. Okay. Um. So it's time for my comments, 
And I just wanted to say thank you to my fabulous staff as always, and that um, we are working on the plan this year. So this this year, uh, the next four or five months will be based will be coming up with our climate action implementation plan. Then we'll need to get that approved um, in this committee and by the board. Um, and then we will go into the implementation phase, which is gonna be really the exciting stuff. And like uh, Ms. Klee just mentioned, there are grants that we're hoping to nab uh, that will help us get into the real implementation phase. Um, one thing I just heard was um, that when you're looking for grants, the money follows the plan. So once we get our plan made and we define our needs, then we can go after the grants and hopefully that will, um, you know, we'll really have some exciting times in the next year or so. There is a cleanup day tomorrow in Aurora. We are headed out from the Cole Center. I'll be there at 7.30 for signups. And uh, it's, it's Kiwanis is uh, one of the main sponsors, but we have other sponsors too. So if you're looking for some real fun tomorrow morning, uh, I think uh, I'm getting there at 7.30. I think it really starts at eight or nine o'clock. But um, so that's at the Cole Center on Illinois Avenue in Aurora. Mr. Kais, do you have a, any other comments you wanna saw my eyes. Yeah, just a, it's gonna be a busy month for Earth Month. And I just wanna remind everybody that uh, on the 20, let's see, the, on Earth Day, we will be, the Forest Preserve is sponsoring a, a plant a tree day at Tekka with the Woods. So if you have the urge to plant an oak or something, come out, be early. Uh, nine o'clock, it starts. Lots of times they have the 500 trees planted in an hour or so, because there's a lot of participation, very popular and on other earth news. Uh, the uh, Forest Preserve is having a plant sale on the 29th, along with all of those other activities. <laughs> I don't know how this all happened on one day. Uh, you can't get them all, because uh, right across from the summit, we'll be doing the plant sale, but you can order plants online and uh, for your garden, pollinator garden to save the your yard and the world at one yard at a time. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I think there's no more neural business and I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. About, Geis? Do we need to put reports oh. on file? First of all, I would entertain a motion to put the reports on file. I would ask, file. Madam Chair, this is Caius, I would ask, uh, request that we, uh, by unanimous consent and no objection, put the four reports on file. Consent, yes, yes. thank you. Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, may I ask for, there's no need for executive session. Uh, now may I have a motion to adjourn. Mr. Todd, Ross, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'll make the motion. To <laughs> okay. adjourn. Jasmine, seconds. Jasmine, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again to my fabulous staff.